Hi, welcome back to another training video on the EDM 830. My name is Dave Kalischuk. I'm the Chief Flight Instructor at Owen Sound Flight Services. And today we're on to Module 4, which is uh, CHT, EGT, and alarms. So we're talking a lot about temperatures and some of the alarm settings on the JPI EDM 830. Uh, let's jump right into it. We're going to start off with a quick video, uh, quick JPI excerpt here on the bar graph display that is on the main screen. So let me get that set up for you. Let's view the blue bar graph or EGT, bar graph presentation. The height of each column represents EGT. To the right of the EGT display bar is a white bar graph showing the cylinder head temperature. Any bar graph that exceeds program limits will flash and change color from yellow to red. The exceeding limit will be displayed below in the numerical display. The cylinder numbers are at the bottom of each column. A square box around the number will indicate that cylinder is currently also in the large numerical display. Above each column is a number in blue showing the exact EGT and white showing the CHT. Okay, so a couple things. Um, they mentioned uh, the bar graphs as they climb, they change color, and this is partially true, um, but they said, uh, first of all, it's a white bar graph, and that's no longer true. It's actually a green bar graph now, and uh, they're also used to uh, change to yellow as it approached the program limit, and it no longer does that. It just goes from green to red. So thanks JPI for not updating the information in a decade and also for taking away our yellow caution range. I don't know why they did that. I did actually reach out to them and uh, they weren't, uh, they didn't have too much information about it. So anyway, it is what it is. So we do have information on the display that's very similar to what they showed there. Let's um, view the blue oh yeah, ever. let's view that. So um, some things we have to be concerned with. Uh, number one, um, what are the limitations? So Lycoming says, for maximum service life of the 0320 engine, CHTs should be maintained between 150 Fahrenheit to 435 Fahrenheit. So there is a low end as well as a high end. Uh, on the low end side, um, you know, if, if we're operating with temperatures too cold, uh, there could be some concerns about um, maybe not um, getting a nice hot combustion burn. Maybe we might get some uh, lead fouling on the spark plugs because some of the uh, lead scavenging agents and fuel uh, can't get hot enough to really burn that lead up. So there are definitely concerns about operating too low in temperatures if you're operating, uh, say, 100 low lead uh, fuel. Um, on the high side, um, you know, 435, again, is, is pretty high. That's uh, what Lycoming is saying as a, as a high end. Actually, they go on further to... Um, say, uh, never exceed the maximum red line, okay? So their maximum red line, again, technically, technically is 500 Fahrenheit, which is absurdly high. So you'd never want to be anywhere near there. But then for maximum service life, cylinder head temperatures should be maintained below 435 during high performance cruise operation and below 400 for economy cruise powers. So what does that mean exactly? Um, well, you can consider the high-performance crews 75% uh, power and above, and the low-performance crews essentially below that. Most of the time in the 172 for us, in our operation, we teach people to uh, set a cruise power of 2300 RPM, and that typically, depending on the outside air temperature, gives us around the 55% horsepower range. Um, it's a nice uh, balance between speed. We're gonna get you know 90 to 95 knots out of that power setting. And also a fuel economy, we're going to burn around eight gallons or so uh, per hour. And um, in the leaning uh, world, um, if pilots are leaning aggressively and they're not maybe as, uh, uh, let's say, pr um, proficient <laughs> at leaning as they could be, and they lean uh, too aggressively, the chances of doing damage to the engine at that power setting is, um, is less. So that's partially why we uh, teach 2300 RPM as a cruise power setting. Now there are higher cruise power settings we can use um, that will make a higher percentage of horsepower that uh, could make it a little more uh, dangerous in the leaning scenario if we're leaning aggressively. Uh, don't wanna, I don't want you to think about leaning as a danger. I want you to think about leaning as a, as a great asset and you need to be 
uh, taught how to do it properly. That's where um, actually module seven, um, which I don't know if we're going to offer that just in-house or if we'll publish it online or not, but it all talks about advanced leaning techniques and how to take care of the engine properly. But anyway, um, so Lycoming says uh, don't go above 435 for high performance cruise and uh, try to stay below 400 for um, your economy cruises. So generally speaking at um, 2300 RPM on any average sort of day, we're usually, uh, maybe our hottest cylinder is uh, 350 to 380 in that range depending on the airplane. But there are situations, um, one of our aircraft right now, we're troubleshooting a high CHT on the number three uh, cylinder, and that's FWQ. So uh, we're looking at some baffling options right now to see and make sure our baffles are all tight to bring that down. Because it's not abnormal to see that cylinder exceed 400 in the climb, even get as high as 420. So we're trying to work on some baffling techniques to bring that temperature down. But it's definitely something that we want to be aware of. And... Um, just monitor in flight and manage manage that temperature as well. Okay, so as we uh, do approach our uh, maximums, our uh, alarm limits that we set, uh, a series of events takes place. Um, so the green bar turns to red on the bar graph. Then the alarm flashes in the numerical display. No matter what setting is on, that setting uh, that parameter will come up in the numerical display and will start to flash followed by a loud bang, smoke, fire, and then screaming. Um, so kind of a joke, but also serious. Um, if we don't pay attention to these alarms, bad things are going to happen. So ideally, we have an idea of what the alarm is, um, what the maximum is, and where we are relative to that at any given time. Um, now that we have this information, this insight into the engine life, um, we need to uh, manage that. So uh, I can tell you in, on a hot summer day, if it's 30 degrees outside, if you're doing a, uh, a normal climb at 80 knots, then you're probably going to get close to 400 uh, on the CHT after a couple thousand feet of climbing. Uh, if you're in CTJ, that's going to be the case. Right now, if you're in FWQ, um, the number three uh, cylinder head temperature um, after even a thousand feet is on a hot day like that will start to exceed 400. And so um, until we resolve that baffling issue or other ways to uh, work on the cooling, um, we need to know that those scenarios exist and manage that. And there's things that we can do to bring the heat down that we'll talk about shortly as well. Okay, so uh, the, the display itself on the EDM830 essentially has two views. There's two ways of looking at the information. Okay, one of them is called percentage view and the other one is called normalized view. Percentage view is the default view when you boot up the system. When we first power on, everything boots up in percentage view. And percentage view essentially um, gives us a, uh, a look at the temperatures in a graph form that is a percentage of the total red line. So. Um, it, you'll know it's in percentage view if there's if you don't see the words norm lit up. Okay, so uh, you would see. Let me just get my laser pointer here. You would see norm NRM on the side here, and also norm on the top if it was in normalized view. But the default uh, at boot up is going to be in percentage view. Um, so percentage view is uh, a way that we can uh, compare the cylinders uh, with actual um, values. Um, just by looking at the bar graph. And so what we see on the actual graph itself is at the bottom, in this scenario, it starts at 200 and it goes up to the red line at 450. So it doesn't show you 0 to 200. So if you first turn the unit on, there won't be anything displayed there. So it's only showing you from 200 to 450 and, and above. So it's only showing you a percentage of the total temperature range uh, from zero. It's only showing you the last half, in a sense, and, the, and then some. So that's why it's called percentage view. It's showing you only a percentage of the actual value. So if you see the bar graph at the very bottom, let's say it's just one blue bar there, that's not um, like 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It's 200. So you're already seeing almost 50% of the, the range that we're expecting to see. So that's called percentage view. That's where we default. That's what um, you will use most of the time. 
Okay, so it shows a percentage of the total values that are there. So at the bottom, 200, at the top, 450. So the scale here is roughly about 50%, give or take, um, of, the, of the value. Um, uh, yeah, so there's my little 50% uh, information. And um, the EGT is also um, displayed. Uh, we set the EGT red line, I believe, in the, in the settings um, it's set, and I think it's around 1650. Um, that being said, there really isn't a top-end EGT. It's just set so that we can have a, a view of the percentage on this graph. Okay, so EGT uh, top-end is typically set to 650, which means the bottom of this graph is somewhere around 800. But again, the exhaust gas temperatures, the exact numbers really don't matter that much. Um, there is no maximum EGT. Lycoming doesn't publish any maximum EGT. Um, EGT is not a, um, a value that we uh, use to determine uh, the stress or pressure or, or damage that we could do to an engine. Um, but cylinder head temperature, on the other hand, is. Cylinder head temperature is our, is our greatest proxy to internal cylinder pressure, essentially. And it's that pressure inside the cylinders that can cause the damage. So when we see numbers like 400, 420, 440, 450, those all really relate to um, damaging pressure that we can get inside the, um, the cylinder itself. So EGT doesn't really matter too much to get the actual number. And even on this graph, you'll see here, um, it's displaying numbers at the top, whereas actually on our graph, it doesn't display the numbers because we have selected a different overall um, layout on the screen where we're maximizing more linear gauges and we're not seeing those EGT numbers. So we only see the CHT numbers. So what's most important about EGT is the bar graphs and how they are relative to each other. So their position relative to each other can give us indications of uh, various conditions that might exist. If one graph was really low or one was really high, um, that could tell us about something that's going on in the engine that uh, we'll talk more about in the uh, run-up and troubleshooting um, uh, module. So um, when we look at these bar graphs, basically we see uh, hotter cylinders are higher than uh, the smaller ones. So smaller is cooler, higher is hotter. And so it, uh, we can see that the um, EGT on number uh, three is cooler than number four, whereas the inverse is true with the CHT. Number four CHT is uh, is actually cooler than number three CHT. So exhaust gas temperatures and cylinder head temperatures don't necessarily follow a trend between each other, um, but but across across the board, compared to their own um, their own temperatures, like CHTs compared to other CHTs and EHTs compared EGTs compared to other EGTs, that's um, that's something that we want to kind of watch out for trends. So uh, at startup, you know, like I said, you won't see anything on there. You'll just see this sort of blank. Uh, display because nothing has actually reached um, the minimum uh, specified on the graph yet so that's why this is a percentage view nothing is really reaching uh, the point where it's even hit 200 yet okay so that's your percentage view percentage view is is uh, a way to see where the temperatures are relative to the red line but it's only going to show you um, basically half of the scale of what's really happening so you'll see a blank slate at the start and that's normally what we use for most of the time I would say on average for most of the type of flying that we do is normally in percentage view uh, so we can see those uh, values relative to each other. Um, there is another um, uh, view that we can use. You can also normalize the I'll just pause that for a second. Called normalize view. Um, normalize view is a way to see very subtle changes in the temperatures. So when we turn on normalize view it basically um, sets the sensitivity a lot higher, about four times higher it sets the sensitivity. And also it will flatline all of the bars. So when we use normalized view, it takes those bars which are showing uh, accurate actual values. So if the blue bar is next to 400, or the white bar is next to the green bar, I guess in real life, is next to the 400, it really is 400. But in normalized view, it will flatline all of the bars um, and create sort of a baseline starting point. So the bars aren't going to represent a specific number. They're just going to flatline and represent uh, a new sort of datum or reference point. 
and then the sensitivity of those bars is going to increase so that one bar now represents, I believe it's a 10 degree Fahrenheit change. So if there's a, even a slight change of 10 degrees Fahrenheit, we'll see that change there. So um, why would we use that? Well, there's a couple of scenarios. Number one, um, when we are established in cruise flight and we're flying straight and level for a long period of time, like on a cross country, we could put the engine monitor into normalized view so that we could see any trends between uh, cylinders and even see slight increases or decreases. Why is this one up from where it was five minutes ago and this one down from where it was five minutes ago? Um, but the problem uh, with that, or at least the one thing you have to be aware of, is as soon as you uh, make a power change in normalized view, if you add some power or remove some power, you will then see a major rises or fall on the EGT and CHT bar graph because those are very sensitive changes um, being displayed relative to power changes that you make. And so they're not really indicative of the actual temperature. So let's say you, uh, you were in cruise at, um, uh, and you, you normal, put the aircraft into ED, EDM into normalized view and then you made a, a 300 RPM power reduction, you would see those bar graphs likely plummet right off of the screen altogether. And you might think, holy crap, what's, uh, what's going on? Is everything just cool right down? But it's only, again, relative um, to where you started, where the power was when you started normalized view. And vice versa, if you had normalized view on, on the ground, for example, and um, you then added power to take off for full power, uh, you would see those bar graphs just skyrocket to the top and you would go, holy crap, <laughs> what's going on? The engine's going to blow up. And uh, so that's not an, actu an accurate uh, representation of the true temperatures. It's a relative temperature to that baseline where your power was set when you first initialized normalized view. Okay, so normalized view um, we also use on the ground when we're um, doing a run-up. We can put the engine monitor into normalized view to see uh, very uh, quick and um, sensitive changes to things that we're doing. So one example would be during the magneto uh, check or the ignition check when we're switching to uh, from both mags to left or to right. Uh, we can actually see rises or falls in the exhaust gas temperature um, based on one mag, a single mag operation versus the dual mag operation. And we can see that much more clearly if we're normalized view because the sensitivity is higher. And there's things that we can watch for when we do those, uh, that ignition uh, system check where we switch to one mag or the other. Same thing with the carb heat check. We'll see changes in temperature even in EGT when we do carb heat checks. So normalized mode is handy on the ground um, during those run-up phases. And we'll talk more about that in the run-up uh, module, the pre-flight module, which I believe is next, and uh, we'll show you what some of that looks like and what to watch out for. Okay, so uh, here's a quick video on normalized view, and then we'll just summarize kind of what we just discussed. So let me play that for you. You can also normalize the display to view small variations by holding the black lean find button down for three seconds. A one bar change in column height represents a 10 degree change. The normalized view permits rapid visualization of EGT trends rather than a percentage of red line. Hold the black lean find button to return to percentage view again. Okay, so um, normalized view changes the value of the graph. It's sort of a new way of looking at the information. Okay, you can think of it like that. And it's used to view very minor changes in EGT. So if we hold the lean fine button down for three seconds, that's the black button. If we hold that down for three seconds, what we'll see is all the uh, temperatures will flatline. And actually, uh, it's not just the EGTs, but the CHTs will also all flatline to the same um, bar. And then um, it changes the sensitivity so that uh, basically um, one change in column height is a change of 10 degrees. Uh, so every segment um, is more sensitive and if we make small power changes or there are small power changes created uh, or small temperature changes within the engine then we'll see that as sort of a major change. So we can use this during the run-up to see uh, rise and fall of um, EGTs with mixture. We can see rise and fall of EGTs when we're operating on single versus dual mag and also uh, with the incorporation of carburetor temperature as well. 
and then we can use it in cruise flight to uh, monitor small variances um, between the temperatures. So, you know, in our um, daily life of flight training, we don't often use normalized mode in level flight because we're not typically at cruise flight for any length of time. We're typically doing some kind of air work exercise. But on a cross country, we would certainly uh, put it into normalized view. And if you uh, have one of these in your own aircraft and you do a lot of uh, flying from point A to point B, then that's probably where you would have it in that scenario. Just remember to take it out of normalized view before you start your descent. <laughs> when you make that power reduction, it's going to look like something very dramatic is happening uh, in the aircraft. Um, so yeah, that's the biggest thing to uh, keep in mind. Um, so if you see huge fluctuations in, um, uh, in the bar graphs, you may be in normalized mode. And to take it out of normalized mode is the same thing as getting into it. You're going to hold the lean find button down for three seconds. Um, when you see large fluctuations in normalized mode, uh, it doesn't show it on this picture, but watch for the word uh, norm here and here. Uh, you'll see that in the uh, module five in the run up. I've got some videos of uh, some run up that we did in the aircraft and you'll see uh, how that system works and all the cool things you can do to troubleshoot, including a, um, a fouled spark plug that we just had uh, last week that was a sad situation where we couldn't go flying, but a great opportunity to shoot some training videos <laughs> and at least put some of that uh, lost flying time to good use. So you'll see that next time. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is um, alarms. And uh, there are several programmable alarms that we can set uh, on the EDM and um, they are very handy as a notification tool to you. They are not um, audible, they're all visual alarms. So when we say the alarm sounds, what I really mean is the alarm um, visually indicates. So if you see that terminology, that's what that means. So let me go to the alarm one and I will just uh, pull up a larger screen video here so that you can see that. The EDM 730 and 830 has factory and user programmable alarms. When a parameter exceeds its normal range, the column will turn yellow, then blinking red. The digital numeric display will flash red, with the value and abbreviation of the alarming item in red. When an alarm is displayed, tapping the white step button will temporarily disable the alarm for the next 10 minutes. You can also hold down the step button until the word off appears. That will disable that alarm for the remainder of the flight. Okay, so, um, so most of that's true. <laughs> most of it's true, uh, except for the part where the bar graph turns yellow and then flashes red. So the bar graph doesn't turn yellow anymore. It basically starts green and then it goes red. I wish it turned yellow. That'd be great. Have a little warning zone in there. Um, if anyone has an EDM 730 or 830 and their bar graph, uh, turns yellow, please let me know uh, where that is in the settings. I feel like that was probably old software that they over overwrote years ago and just never went back to for some reason, but it would have been a great feature to have. But anyway, so um, oil temperature alarm is one example. If we see the oil temperature alarm sounding, we, get, we need to do something about it. So we've set our alarm lower than the factory limit so that we have some time to make a change. And ultimately, um, when the alarm sounds, we need to reduce heat. So we gotta get some of that heat out of there. And there's not a whole lot of ways to do that in, uh, in this kind of aircraft other than to um, reduce power. So reducing power will definitely um, pull some heat out because we're not generating as much heat. Um, reducing the uh, angle of attack, if we can lower the nose, uh, because these aircraft are air-cooled through the front scoop, that will certainly improve the uh, cooling and increase airspeed. So if we could even um, get that nose lower, get more speed or get that nose lower to um, uh, gain more um, forward moment, I guess more, more airflow, uh, even descending would be a great way to do that. Uh, then, then that could help um, cool the engine, bring that oil temperature down as well. So when the alarm sounds, um, something has to be done. Immediate action is required, basically. We're setting the alarms to a point where we need to do something right away. Um, the next one we have is oil pressure. So we have some alarms uh, at the high end and the low end. Uh, if you remember from ground school, you know, high oil pressure and low oil pressure, these could be indicators of um, impending engine problems. High oil pressure you might see on a cold day. If you are one of those pilots that uh, jump in the aircraft, turn the key, and within about three to five minutes, you're ready to take off, um, that's maybe, uh, 
going to cause the engine to not be as warm as it could be, the oil to not be as warm as it could be, and then the oil pressure when you ask for full power on takeoff could be quite high. So, you know, um, you need to take your time and go through your checks and try not to be in a rush. You know, it's hard. We're always on a schedule. Time is of the essence. Time is money. But um, try to enjoy what, you know, you're, what you're doing with flying. Try to take it a little slower. Spend more time. Let the oil um, temperature itself come up, and then you will see lower oil pressures as a result. But if you see um, higher oil pressure, um, you can reduce that pressure by reducing some power, if it's appropriate. I mean, if you're trying to climb over trees, you probably don't want to reduce power. But um, if you are uh, seeing that high oil pressure on a cold day and... Um, you know, in your run-up you see it, and then you give it more time, let the oil temperature come up to a higher temperature and warm up a little bit more. Um, if you see low oil pressure, uh, that could be a problem, obviously, with... Um, uh, um, obviously, that scenario where we have low oil pressure and high oil temperature, that's the, that possible oil leak scenario where we've um, maybe had some loss of oil cooling, and now we're seeing the temperature rise with the pressure drop, and that's that impending engine failure scenario. So we want to be uh, preparing to land somewhere in that, in, in that case. So basically just watching for those and considering what the next course of action would be. Um, low fuel warnings, so low fuel uh, alarms. Um, basically we need to um, be aware of where the alarms are set. So we have ours set to uh, set, a, set a, an alarm at 8 gallons. When we get down to 8 gallons of fuel, an alarm is going to um, visually display. And also in endurance, we have another alarm set to 1 hour of endurance remaining. We have an alarm set. So when you have 1 hour of fuel left, that's 1 hour total in the, in the tank. That's not including the, you're supposed to land with 30 minutes of fuel remaining in day VFR and 45 minutes at night VFR. So 1 hour is a, is a pretty good uh, place to set that to notify pilots, hey, you uh, don't have a whole lot of time left. And uh, so when you see that alarm, basically you want to plan your arrival and um, get ready to land somewhere, at least uh, determine how far you are away from the next place of landing. Um, so let's uh, just talk a little bit more about alarms. Uh, here's a picture of uh, the EDM um, with the engine off. Uh, with the engine off, we see uh, zero RPM, so we know the engine's off. And 29.9 uh, manifold pressure um, would just be representing atmospheric pressure at that point. But alarms aren't just, let me get my little laser pointer here, alarms shouldn't be just considered um, flashing red things here. Alarms should also be considered um, red numbers in here. So consider this also a type of an alarm. It's something that should alarm you. It's something that should tell you this parameter is not in spec. If you see red versus white, that means it has not reached the required uh, level for you to operate. Also consider alarms like these red X's. These red X's could be an indication that this system is not functioning properly. Um, so that is something that we need to investigate and determine why is that happening. Now in this case, that data field is the time to empty in hours and minutes and the reason it's not on is because the engine's not running and if the engine's not running there's no gallons per hour and there's no way to uh, determine how much time we can run so that's why that's crossed out but when the engine starts that should not be crossed out there shouldn't be any X's there shouldn't be any red numbers there shouldn't be anything red flashing at you those are all should be considered as um, alarms for the for the sake of this discussion and, and how you use alarms in general um, the other thing we have to um, be careful of uh, as pilots um, in the setting of these parameters when we're setting alarms and determining what the alarm level should be is um, don't set an alarm somewhere where you think you might see that alarm go off um, to any, any often degree. So what I mean by that is like our CHT um, alarm. A lot of people would want to stay under 400 uh, for CHT in cruise flight. And maybe in cruise flight um, you might want to be alarmed if your CHT exceeds 400 because we want to stay below that. But if your CHT also um, often breaks 400 in a climb, then that means what you're going to be doing a lot of time when you're climbing is as, you, as it breaks 400, you're going to say, oh, that's okay for the climb. You're going to disable that alarm. 
and then um, next time it sounds uh, it will be 10 minutes later so what if that temperature kept on climbing above and above and above that point um, and it's been disabled for 10 minutes or what if worst case scenario you actually disabled the alarm permanently uh, which is another feature you can do that you, we suggest you don't um, then that can continue to climb without seeing it um, so set alarms uh, to places where you wouldn't often see uh, them go. That's why we have our CHT alarm set at 420 um, because that is a place where we want to take immediate action and um, not just at 400 which we know will break. In cruise flight we just have to monitor that to keep them under 400 because that's our ideal goal but we don't want to get in the habit of disabling alarms so that's what I want to say as the general theme don't get in the habit of disabling alarms because if that becomes the norm, um, then that adds a huge risk fa factor to um, missing out on information that should be alarming. Set the alarms at a place where if this value is to flash, immediate action is to be taken. That's my suggestion to you. Okay, um, so another couple cool things just to talk about with this picture. This picture, again, is taken with... Um, the engine off. So this was after uh, the aircraft sat um, for I think about a week to a week and a half and I uh, was just checking in on the battery actually. I was checking in to see how the battery was holding a charge and it was um, down to 11.1 .1 volts after a couple of weeks. So that could be an indication that um, maybe the battery is starting to uh, get a little bit weak if it uh, has trouble holding 12 volts for any length, length of time. Uh, you know, a week or two weeks in, um, in below zero temperatures um, may not be too concerning if it was 11 and a half, 11.3, it's up, it's, it depends on the battery. Um, but just be aware that that's something you can watch out for and maybe throw a charger on it or try to get it flying to bring that um, battery life back up again. Um, the other thing that's interesting to see is um, outside air temperature. So outside air temperature is in Celsius, so it's 4 degrees Celsius. The airplane was in the hangar at 4 degrees Celsius. Um, but the cylinder um, head temperatures were in the 66 to 70 range and the oil temperature was at 73. Um, now this is in Fahrenheit, okay, and this is in Celsius, so again back to that apples to apples thing. Um, you unfortunately can't put the, um, well, you can change the outside air temperature to Fahrenheit if you like, that's a setting that you want. Uh, we deal with Celsius here in Canada, so that's more common. But to give you an apples to apples comparison, um, 73 on oil temperature in Fahrenheit is about 22 Celsius, where the outside air temperature is only four degrees Celsius. So why is there the discrepancy there? Well, this is because we are preheating the engine. So we have a uh, heating pad under the belly pan of the oil, uh, sump and that heats the engine. So whenever the temperature um, is five degrees Celsius or below uh, we preheat the engines because we like to take care of our engines. Um, you know you could get away with not preheating to zero probably even minus five um, but we like to uh, baby them a little bit so they last longer they take good care of us we take care of them they take care of us and so we preheat and as a result of preheating we can see the direct results on the engine. So the outside air temperature is 4 degrees Celsius, whereas the oil temperature is about 22, and the cylinder head temperatures are around 20. So that's really nice, even just through that lower bottom um, belly pan, we can get temperatures of the engine up to summer-like temperatures to facilitate with easy starting and just take care of the engine that much more. Another interesting one is actually the carb temperature. It's, it's way up there at a 111 uh, Fahrenheit, so that's... Um, a surprising uh, that the carburetor is getting a lot of that heat from that um, belly pan um, so that's a, around 40 plus degrees um, Celsius. Uh, as soon as the engine starts that's going to drop down dramatically that'll just go shoom, right down but um, we can see the uh, impacts of preheating which is really nice uh, to know that that uh, device is, is working and doing its job so that's another cool thing just to see in that in that picture there for the preheating and the battery life uh, that we can kind of monitor in the background. Um, so cancellation of alarms. Uh, so again, you can cancel an alarm by pressing the um, white step button, which will disable the alarm for 10 minutes. Okay, and if you, uh, and then the alarm will come back again. But if in that time, you know, so that parameter has exceeded again, you will not be notified of that. And you can also disable the alarm permanently by holding down the step button um, to turn it off the whole time. 
But my suggestion is, um, if you have to ever do that, then you need to ask yourself, um, is the alarm set appropriately in the first place? Because you don't want to get in the habit of disabling alarms temporarily, and you really don't want to get in the habit of disabling them permanently. There should be another solution that you uh, put in place that is probably to change the alarm limit or to investigate why that alarm went off in the first place if something is happening. So as far as we're concerned under our policy for Owen Sound Flight Services, um, we do not want you to disable the alarm um, permanently if, under any circumstances. If you see an alarm going off um, and you need to disable it, you have first to ask yourself, why is this alarm going off and is this relevant? And if it is, make a change. And if you see it again, ask yourself again, why is it happening now? And uh, if it goes off twice, then that's probably um, causing you some concern. You probably should be considering landing, at least the way we have it configured for our aircraft. Um, but we don't want you disabling the alarm for the entire flight. If you go on to, uh, I've mentioned um, uh, Savvy Aviation and Mike Bush, and if you look at some of their uh, webinars and some of the content that they put out in, uh, in letters and written uh, form, you will read uh, a couple of horror stories about people that have disabled alarms. Um, and then in, in the background, while that alarm is disabled, uh, the engine's going into a thermal runaway and um, the cylinders are blowing up. So you need to be really aware of why the alarm is there, what's, what does it mean, take immediate action to um, get the alarm to go away. It's better to leave the alarm, let's say you had a CHT alarm in a climb, better to leave the alarm flashing and disable it through action instead of disable it by pressing the white button. So if the alarm is flashing at you 420, um, lower the nose, reduce the power, and watch that CHT come down and let the alarm go off naturally then to disable it um, manually. So that would be the ideal situation. Okay, so that's uh, what I want to say on alarms in general. Um, the alarms, uh, when they do flash, will again bring up that flashing uh, red uh, to indicate what's happening. No matter what uh, setting the numerical display is on, you will see it, it will show um, in that numerical display what parameter has exceeded. And so ours is set for 420. So if the alarm sounds, we need to take immediate action by increasing the cooling, either reduce the angle of the climb, or reduce the power, or increase the airspeed. That's basically all you got in a 172 that's uh, normally aspirated, air-cooled. Um, get the nose down, and uh, better, you know, better to uh, be proactive even. Uh, anticipate, oh, it's uh, 25 degrees Celsius outside with a 100% uh, relative humidity. Uh, we better do this uh, departure climb at 85 knots this time instead of, instead of 80 and uh, then we can mitigate the alarm even going on in the first place. So those are the kind of uh, proactive ways that you could fly. Now that you know what's going to happen, um, you can incorporate that into your flying technique. Uh, when the CHT approaches the alarm limit, uh, the green CHT column turns red, and uh, when it meets or exceeds the limit, then uh, it starts to uh, flash red. The entire um, uh, box flashes red, and then the red and is displayed in, down below in the numerical display. So those are some of the things that you are watching out for. So uh, like I said, you know, as you're approaching even 400, you should be taking action to do things to minimize the alarm from happening. The best bet is you know that the alarm would happen if this scenario was uh, to take place. If you're to do this type of a climb on this type of a temperature day, for this long of a period, you know you will get this alarm, so better to try a different climb. And that mitigates you even approaching uh, anywhere close to that number and then allows you to um, operate the aircraft most efficiently. So uh, that's a basic um, overview of CHT, EGT, and alarms. Um, there's a lot there. Some of the main uh, points are understanding the different modes, percentage view versus normalized uh, view how to get in and out of those, so basically holding down the lean fine for three seconds to enter one or the other and understand what each of them is showing you. Um, understand uh, limitations and where we set our alarms and how to avoid uh, getting to that point or to mitigate that. Understand what the alarm means when you see it and what action can be taken to, uh, to remedy that. Try to remedy that with, um, with aircraft action like reducing power, lowering the nose, whatever the case is, instead of disabling it with the actual button itself. If there is an alarm that's going off that you can determine is um, uh, maybe not practical or not, not actually relevant or there's some error or there's some reason why it's going off, 
then it is acceptable to disable it once. But if it happens again, um, you should be probably looking for somewhere to land and uh, permanently find a resolution to that. But in no cases should you ever disable the alarm permanently. At least this is our internal policy. You can develop your own policies, whatever you like. But that's um, how we're utilizing alarms to operate. And so just make sure you're setting your alarm limits. If you own one of these uh, pieces of equipment, set your alarm limits to a place where you would not normally see that limit um, exceeded so that you can get out of any kind of habit of shutting off alarms. That's probably the worst thing that you could do is get in the habit of disabling alarms. Oh, that alarm always goes off. I disable it. Well, then um, set the set the parameter differently and, um, and, and deal with that because that's the better way to do it than to get into this uh, scenario. Okay, so that's it for CHT, EGT, and alarms. I hope you enjoyed that uh, video a little longer than some of the previous, not as long as the first, but lots to discuss there. Um, the next module that we are getting into is a pre-flight module where we're going to talk about some troubleshooting uh, with the run-up and some cool things that we can see, again, utilizing this normalized view uh, in the run-up scenario. So thanks for watching. Take care. Have a good day. Fly safe.